it all in. Uh oh, and now we're recording. And a reminder that if you've got your camera on and if you participate in the chat, you're going to be recorded. So just making sure you've got that information, <laughs> much like all the sessions today. So I do want to um, invite you, though, to take a minute. One of the things that I miss about face to face conferences is when we do face to face conferences, you would have finished the other session and, I, and I, I zoomed in just in time to hear people kind of finishing up a session. And so there was that few minutes of it would have been like a bathroom break and grab a soda and a cookie and head to the next session. And that conversation in the hallway that couldn't happen because we were virtual. And so what I wanna do is take just a minute to have you all think about what you would have said to somebody as you transitioned from the last class, when you think about what, what you've done today and um, how things have, have worked and how your, um, how your sessions have gone and just thinking about what, um, what resonated with you, what really fit, what made you think, I'm gonna use that when I get to work on Monday or on Tuesday. Um, what, what was that one thing that you wanna make sure you ask somebody, is that really how it works for you? Cause it doesn't work that way for me. Um, or here's this really cool idea. I have to run it by you because I thought of it when they said something else. So thinking about that one thing that you learned today, I want you to do um, a little bit of reflecting, a little bit of thinking about for some of you that was at like 930 this morning when this whole show started. And it might be something one of the secretaries said or something the governor said that made you really think about volunteer engagement. Um, but what I want you to do is to um, participate in what we're going to call a super chat. And the way a super chat works is that you um, get your chat open, get that chat open and set it so that everyone can see your answer. And as you do that, you're thinking about what is that one thing that I learned today that is just that is what resonated, but don't hit enter. That's the really important thing. And it's also the hardest thing I'm asking you to do is don't hit enter. Get your answer typed in because it takes you it takes us, some of us a little longer to type our answer. Get your answer typed in. Make sure your chat is set so everyone can see your answer. And then your um, your task is to once you get it done to just hold your hands up so I can see your hands so that I can so that I can tell that you've got an answer typed in. So don't remember don't hit enter yet because we want everybody hit enter at one time. So. so I'm seeing a couple of hands. This is good. Don't hit enter now. Don't do it. Wait till I tell you. This is the important part and the hard part of this activity. Something that you learned can be just a word or a phrase, something that may not be really new, but just kind of reminded you of something that you think is really gonna be helpful or, or useful for you when you get back into your space and, and re-engage with your volunteers. So, okay, I'm seeing some more hands. So I'm gonna do a countdown here and then, and, and only then wait till we get to zero so, oh, there we go. Lots of hands. Awesome. So five, four, three, two, one. Hit enter. Let's see what happens. Oh, I love it. Okay. So you see all of the answers just come just jumping in all at one time. It's kind of cool. Um, so resources around volunteer and see online volunteering information, collectivistic culture in volunteer management. That's kind of an interesting concept. I want to know more about that one. Conversations have me thinking about strategic planning for, and you know, strategic planning is now even different than it was pre-COVID. So lots of things to think about. Six steps to plan amazing virtual training. That looked like an interesting one. Generational differences, surveys and getting feedback. Okay, diverse audiences. Awesome. So lots of cool things that you've learned today. I think one of the, like I said, I think one of the things that I would challenge you to do is as this conference winds down, take a few minutes to send an email to somebody and say, I, I was at this really great conference and here's something I learned. Because the more times you think about it, say it, um, repeat it, um, again, figure out how to reword it, rephrase it, it's going to give you an opportunity to really learn it, to really ingrain it to really have a better shot at using some of the new stuff. So I encourage you to have a conversation with somebody. Maybe it's your spouse. My husband hears a lot of things that I learned on, on uh, Zoom because I need somebody to just sound it out to. And so I encourage you to find somebody 
to share this with so that there's a minute of thinking and reflecting because we know that's a part of how we learn. And so thinking about this whole adult learning thing and trying to think, how do I cram the basics of volunteer management into 45 minutes? I settled on the idea that what I'm gonna focus on is thinking about 10 things to think about. I'm not gonna try to teach the whole class in 45 minutes. It doesn't make sense. So, um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at 10 concepts or 10 items that I think when we think about the very basic um, work of volunteer engagement, there are a handful of things that are true across the board, no matter what agency you're working with and no matter how long you've done it, it doesn't hurt to be reminded of some of those things. So the first one, and these are not in any particular order and I gathered them by looking at textbooks and looking at some of the literature, some of the research around competencies for volunteer managers. And so, um, so it's my compilation of other people's data. So the first one is that risk management um, begins the moment you decide you're gonna engage volunteers. Um, we, before you ever have a volunteer enter the door, and for many of you, volunteers have been entering your doors for a lot of years. And some of you inherited programs, um, that may have been amazingly well thought out. And let's face it, some of us really need to do some rethinking when we think about risk management. Um, risk management involves our organization. It involves thinking about from an enterprise level, what are like business continuity plans and some of those kinds of things. Um, it's about thinking about um, reputation damage. If there is, um, if, if something goes, goes terribly wrong, it's about the safety of our clients. It's about taking care of the public that we serve. It's about making sure our volunteers are protected as well as our staff members. And so volunteer management, uh, risk management is a huge component of volunteer management kind of at every level. And it's that thing that sometimes will really scare people away from it a little bit. So we have to um, pay attention to the idea that there are things that can go really badly wrong really quickly and by planning for preparing for those things, hopefully um, when things happen, because trust me, things happen, even if you plan as carefully as you know how things happen. Um, and this, this means that if we've got a plan in place, we've thought through some of the contingencies and we have, we have been careful enough to say, should this happen? Here are some realities we can, um, we can rest on. Here are some things that we can count on. Um, most of us in the state, um, and in-state agencies have access to folks like the Attorney General's office, and we have organizations that are very, um, very specifically guided by protocols and guidelines and policies. And so we have a way to double check and make sure that that our our risks are covered and mitigated to some extent. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're doing that. And it's sometimes it's as simple as making sure that we do volunteer screening. Sometimes it's as simple as making sure they have the right equipment to do the job so that they're um, doing the right thing effectively and efficiently and safely. So risk management begins even before you um, bring folks in. Um, so paying attention to risk management is, is a thing, not the most important thing necessarily, but one of the things that we definitely wanna think about related to volunteer engagement. So one of the other things that we wanna think about is role descriptions. Um, Role descriptions are not the sexy part of what we do. They're not the fun part. They're that paperwork that has to happen. Um, but what we know to be true is that if we are putting role descriptions together, we are better prepared to invite people to be a volunteer. Um, it's not unusual for me to have folks. I work with Cooperative Extension. And so I work with folks in 101 extension centers across the state. And so it's not unusual for me to get a phone call from an agent and they, they say, I need volunteers. And so what do you think my first question is for those folks who say, I need volunteers? Any ideas what my first question might be? It, yeah, what kind of volunteers? What for? What do you need them to do exactly? Because until you can answer that question, you don't really need volunteers. Um, so when you have opportunities within your organization and you're beginning to think about, I need people to help me do this. What is this? What does it look like? What is, you know, what, how long is it gonna take? When does it begin? Where do I have to go? Do I need special equipment? 
lots of questions that volunteers have. Um, and I know personally, if, if somebody calls me, unless it's my sister or my mom, if they call me and they say, I need help, my first question is going to be to do what? Because if it's one of them, I know the answer better be yes, ma'am. But otherwise, I need to know what it is that you need. The reality there is if I'm not the person you need to do the job and you can describe the job to me, I might know people who can help me do that job. I might know somebody to refer you to who is better at it. Um, you know, if you, if you call me to help um, selective harvesting in a forest, I am not your person. But I know some people who do forestry stuff and they might know people who are looking for opportunities in that arena. So I might be able to help you get to somebody, but it might not be me. But I wouldn't know that unless you could tell me what it is that you need me to do. Um, Susan Ellis, who was one of the first international volunteer management consultants um, many years ago, once said that recruiting for volunteers before you have a role description was a lot like starting to dance before the music begins, because you're very likely to not be in sync with the music. And so that idea of as you gather people together to do the work that you need to happen, if you can't describe the work, you probably don't need the people yet. So um, role descriptions are important in the recruitment and they are actually the first step in any recruitment campaign. The other thing that I, um, the other soapbox I kind of get on about role descriptions is that they are an absolutely essential part of your risk management strategy. Because one of the first questions, if there's an incident or uh, say, you know, something happens, something goes on um, at the, um, at the, you know, in an office, in a program, one of the first things that happens when we call for help from our um, legal folks, one of the first things that they ask is, what was the scope of our responsibility? And if we can't tell them what we were supposed to be doing, we've got a whole different kind of problem. So making sure that we are um, able to describe exactly what we were supposed to be doing. So um, I think about one of the examples that, um, that, that we've used for years when we um, have done volunteer training is the idea of um, folks who do um, grocery delivery services. And this is supposedly a true story, not my story, but supposedly a true one where a volunteer delivered groceries to an elderly lady's home. And the lady asked them to um, change a light bulb and the volunteer climbed up on a step ladder that the, that the client provided and changed the light bulb. And in doing that, fell and broke his leg. Well, it was outside the scope of his responsibility and delivering groceries. And so it became a massive mess. Um, because he was just trying to help a client, but what the client asked him to do was outside the scope of his work for the organization. And so the organization's liability policy didn't cover him. You get the picture. So yeah, exactly. Oh my goodness. So think about role descriptions as a way to help our volunteers manage. And, and it gives them a place that's a protection for our volunteers, a place where they can point to and say, I, you know, it is outside, you know, that's above my pay grade. That is outside of, of, you know, you hate for anybody to say, that's not my job. That's not what we want to, that's not what we want to instill, but that idea of there are certain things that I'm really not supposed to do. Um, and the other thing about writing role descriptions is there are a million samples. Um, this is one of those places where I would join the, the younger generation and saying, Google it. There are a million samples. Um, one of the other things I would suggest is that you invite your volunteers to help you review your role descriptions because it is, like I said, it is not the fun part of what we do for most of us, but it's important. And if you've got volunteers who are in that job, who better to help you take a look at them and decide, is that really what you do? Is that really what it feels like? Is that really um, the limit of, of um, what you do for our clients and how you do it? So um, don't be afraid to ask your volunteers to help with updating your role descriptions. Um, so another of our 10 things is the idea that program marketing is not volunteer recruitment. We have um, this really bad habit in our volunteer programs sometimes of thinking that if I'm out telling people about the wonderful things we do, and I mentioned that, oh yeah, and volunteers help us do it, that that's volunteer recruitment. I don't know why they don't come up and just tell me that they want to help me. 
Well, first of all, you're telling them how great your program is, not what kinds of volunteers you need. So when you think about program marketing and volunteer recruitment and the distinction between the two, um, I'm going to market the program to anybody that listen, right? I'm going to share information with everybody, whether I think they're a stakeholder or whether they're a potential stakeholder or whether they're a potential donor. I'm going to tell the public. I'm going to tell my boss. I'm going to tell my best friend. I'm going to tell people at church. I want everybody to know about my great program. But I need to be thinking about who are the people that we need to engage to help us do that work. And to be intentional then about thinking about where am I going to find those people? Because one of the things that we know about volunteer recruitment is you kind of have to go to where the people are who have the skills that you need if you want to get connected to them. So if I need people who can volunteer for me between eight and five during the day, I'm probably not going to just post flyers at a workplace because let's face it, they're at work. Um, even in our, our current COVID environment of this hybrid working concept, I, I will tell you that I'm in my home office today. I'm not on the campus, but I have been working since about 6.30 this morning with one Zoom or another because we're in multiple time zones and we're, we're doing what we do. So being at home during the day does not mean that I'm not working during the day. Now, my mom is in her 80s and is retired. She's a perfect candidate for helping you out during the day. My mom is also retired and she will tell you that she had to report at a certain time every day for a long time. And so she wants flexibility. She wants to be able to come and go a little bit. So when we think about our volunteer recruitment, we need to be thinking about opportunities for folks to help decide what their, what their volunteer work looks like within the parameters that we have, that we can assign those opportunities. Um, I work with a mentoring program, and there's some very real, any of you that work with mentoring and um, with direct client services kinds of programs, there are some very real standards and guidelines that we have to follow that we can't, we can't deviate from too much. And so making sure that we are aware of and engaged with our volunteers and helping them understand those parameters helps us to find the right people and fit them in with the right jobs. So that whole concept of recruitment begins with a great role description, begins with us thinking about risk management and how we're gonna engage them safely. But it's also about where do I go to find people? You know, if I need to find people who know how to bowl, I'm probably gonna go look at a bowling alley, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna advertise there. So thinking about where am I gonna find people who have the skill set that I need to do the work that I need to happen. So another consideration is the idea that orientation is a critical part of our success. Um, we are good, I think, in some of our programs that have long-term volunteers at really paying attention to orientation. And we know that by definition, orientation is, doing, is, is helping our volunteers know what they need to do to do the job we have for them to do right now. It is preparing to do the work that you've been asked to do right now. This is not about long-term development. This is about being ready to do the job today. So this is everything from how to run the copier and how to answer the phone and um, where's the bathroom to where's the first aid kit and who do I ask if I have questions. It's the basic stuff that I need to be successful in my job today. Um, where we're in a situation where we have a lot of virtual volunteers. And I would argue that even our virtual, maybe especially our virtual volunteers, don't skip orientation for those folks. Don't assume that they know how to use your software. Don't assume that they understand your standards around things like social media and email messaging and um, participation in online meetings. Make sure that you have got an orientation that covers what you need them to do so that they can be prepared to do a good job for you. Um, I think even when we do our group activities, group events, it's gonna be really important to make sure that they understand um, things like if there's a dress code, you know, if you go to the food bank to be a volunteer, um, they have insurance guidelines that say you have to have uh, closed toed, closed heeled shoes if you are going to work on the floor in the warehouse. Um, you have to be a certain age. Um, once you get there, 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 there's an on-site orientation that you have to complete. It's about safety. And so um, they are required by their insurance folks to make sure that that happens. 
even if you're not required by your insurance folks, I can promise you that if you are going to be a volunteer, you're going to want to be oriented and you would want to do the same thing, I would think, for your volunteers. Um, a couple of things to be careful of here. One is make sure your orientation matches to the work that you're going to have people doing. Um, I volunteered for a huge um, international event that was here in North Carolina many, many years ago. And in order to be a volunteer, you had to attend a four hour face to face orientation with like 800 of your closest friends. So we went to this amphitheater. You, you had to get into all kinds of lines to get to the right place and sign all kinds of forms. And so you go through all this stuff and then they start doing an orientation that includes saying hello in like 12 languages, which was awesome. Don't get me wrong. It was awesome. I'm not sure I could tell you today how to say hello in any of those languages. It was just a lot of information in a hurry and not what I expected to be hearing at that point because I thought I was going to get orientation to do the work they needed me to do. And the work they assigned me to was dining hall. I have no food service background, but it's cool. I can, I can help in the dining hall. So I go to the dining hall after my orientation. Now orientation is four hours, right? I have to be at the dining hall at 530 in the morning because I'm on the breakfast shift. So I live 30 minutes away from campus. So I had to come in. And so I'm up at four o'clock. I'm there. I am there. And I walk in and they don't know what I'm supposed to do at that site. So there was no opportunity for them to orient us on site because they didn't know what we were supposed to do. But yet we had set through a four hour orientation that told us nothing about what we were supposed to do. Don't do that to your volunteers. Don't do that. They will never come back. I promise they will never come back. Make sure that your orientation in terms of its length and its content matches what you're going to have your volunteers do as much as you can. Um, I know some organizations require a standard um, orientation for all of their um, employees, all of their volunteers. Um, there are others that have kind of a core that everybody gets, and then um, it's uniquely by department or by division or by assignment, um, additional orientation, which makes perfect sense. So paying attention to what's included in orientation gives you a way um, to manage how much time is spent there and also to make sure that your volunteers have what they need to do the work that you need them to do. So definitely pay attention to your plans for your orientation for your volunteers. So another thing to think about is the idea that supervision happens at the closest possible level. Um, in organizations like mine, where we have volunteers in literally 101 centers across the state, um, and some of you are the same way. You might be um, at a museum that has multiple buildings or that has multiple floors with very different programs from one floor to the next. And you're recruiting as the volunteer manager or volunteer specialist, you're recruiting volunteers that may be assigned anywhere on that campus or within that structure. And you're recruiting volunteers based on the request of somebody in a department or in um, you know, in a division in a certain program area. So thinking about how are you going to be able to supervise them, right? If you've got three or 400 people who come and go, you're gonna depend on those people in that division or in that department to do the supervising for that volunteer. That's the day-to-day -day work that they do. So making sure that they understand their role as supervisors of those volunteers, um, and making sure that they are prepared for that volunteer to be on site and that they're prepared um, to complete whatever evaluation you have in your system for those volunteers. Because you as the volunteer manager can't do that for them if you're not seeing the work that they do every day. It's really unrealistic to think that you could complete their evaluations. So supervision needs to happen at the closest possible level to where the volunteer is actually working. So. Um, Sometimes this requires um, a little work at what I would call organizational readiness. Sometimes we have to help our staff members appreciate that volunteers are not free, um, but that they are worth the cost. And so helping our folks understand the importance of being welcoming and inviting our volunteers in 
um, I talked with uh, a colleague and, and mentioned, you know, that we were having this conversation. And she said, oh, tell them my story. She was a kindergarten mom who had volunteered to help with the book fair. And when she showed up at the library, the librarian looks at her and, and, and she has to wait in line to get a turn to even talk to the librarian. And she says, I'm here to be your volunteer for the book fair. And the, and the librarian says, I don't need you. Oh, so then I said, did you just turn around and leave? And she said, well, I offered to, offered to do several things. I offered to shelve books. I offered to, because she had had some experience in a library and was looking forward to being in the library. She never went back to the volunteer in the library. So she never volunteered with the book sale. So understanding that your staff need to understand, staff members need to understand that what they do and how they act when the volunteer shows up to do the work makes a huge difference in whether that volunteer comes back and stays um, and is retained in the organization. So helping our staff members be ready for volunteers to be there is important. We shift gears to think about recognition. So we go from all of the preparation stuff and we jump to recognition. This, is, this really is kind of one of the fun parts of the job, that idea of making sure that people feel valued and appreciated. Um, one of the challenges here is making sure that we understand what's important to our volunteers. Um, there's lots of um, personality assessments that you can do. There's colors and understanding Myers-Briggs. Myers-Briggs is a little more complicated, a little more expensive, but um, there's also information about the love languages and the, um, the kind of um, tool that's available there to understand the love languages at work have to do with appreciation and how we feel valued in what we do. And so understanding your volunteers and what matters to them may help you determine what kind of volunteer recognition makes the most sense. So um, even as I kind of rattle through some of these things, I'm gonna ask you to drop in your chat. If you have like a cool way that you recognize your volunteers, share that with us, because I'd, um, I'd love to get you engaged a little bit in thinking about volunteer recognition. Um, we know that it happens both formally and informally. So formal recognition might be that end of the year, you're so great, thanks, here's your pin service, um, your years of service pin rather um, for your volunteers. Um, and then, and a couple of mentions on the, the birthday cards, that's, that's considered an informal recognition process. Um, acknowledging volunteers with, um, I love this, personal notes. Um, and then the annual volunteer appreciation dinner, we do those, right? Um, but understanding, um, what your volunteer values. I volunteered with um, a different state agency at one point, not mentioning it. It was many years ago. Um, but one of the things that they did, it was I was an episodic volunteer, only had a conversation with one other volunteer because we were team together um, and only knew her and the director of volunteers. But they did an amazing like end of year recognition service. But reality for me is I didn't know any of the other volunteers out of the 200 there. And so attending that just meant one more night away from home. So it was not necessarily my favorite thing. So understand what your volunteers value. Um, and that helps you to think about where you invest your resources and your, and your time. So um, thank you. No, oh, a free planetarium pass. That's kind of cool. Complimentary passes based on hours of service. I like that. Um, junior docents uh, receive a blue core. Oh, I love that. So they get a cord to wear at graduation. That is a cool idea. Um, dinner at the mansion and the Capitol. That's very cool. Um, oh, a free family membership to the museum when they hit a certain level. That's really cool. Lots of great ideas. And I think to the extent that you can do things like that, I think one of the things that many volunteers value is that we include their families um, when we do things. Um, token gifts, Pam, I love that one. The idea of just some, just some little thing that says thank you. Um, special presentation, oh, so they know about stuff, kind of the insider's view of what's coming. That's really cool. Um, one of the things that I have learned that is a minimal cost kind of thing is those personal thank you notes. Um, sometimes from um, Program participants, if you have that, if a, if a program participant stops and sends a message, that's really a cool, um, a cool way to say thank you to your volunteer. Um, or a note from you. Um, I, got a, I, got, I got a note one time from, I had done a workshop for, um, for a group and 
um, they had, you know, they had given me like the, the conference thank you bag thing, which was, was very cool. Um, but then a couple of weeks later, I got this envelope and I didn't recognize it was like, it was one from one of the County centers in extension. And I kind of thought, okay, I opened it up and it was a copy of the program from that conference. And they had literally on the front of that program written a note and said, here are a couple of things that I learned from your session. And I appreciate that you make time to do this for us. So it was a small thing. It, it literally cost them a stamp because I mean, it was the conference program. It's not even like they invested in a card, but that's one of the ones I saved. So thinking about what matters to your volunteer, it may be that they helped with your big fundraising event. And so just to flip that program over and on the back, write a personal note that says, you know, we couldn't have done this without you. Is going to matter to some of your volunteers in a way that you know a sixty dollar dinner is 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 nice, but it's not the same thing. So know your volunteers and know what matters to them. Um, so um, Natalie mentions docent trips. Nancy mentions doing hikes just for the volunteers and their families that aren't open to the general public. See again that whole idea of the insider and and being able to include your family because more and more we're finding. We want to be able to include our significant others and significant folks in our lives and some of the work that we do. So I love these ideas. Um, uh, one other really quick one, and you all may be doing some of this, but we helped um, put some plants in at one of our um, one of our 4-H camps. And the marketing um, director was just walking around that day. We were putting out straw and mulching and screwing in the um, seats at the fire ring and doing all kinds of stuff and just really sweaty and dirty. And she was just walking around taking pictures and I was kind of not happy, I will admit. And then two or three days later in the mail and it's a postcard. So there's a picture on one side of you know the group of us working and then it's addressed individually. And it literally said, we would never have been ready for opening if y'all hadn't come and helped us. And so it cost her printing and it cost her, um, you know, a postcard stamp, which is not, you know, I guess it's not as much as a letter anymore. It's probably about to be the same. Um, but thinking about showing a volunteer the difference they made in the work that they did, something as simple as a really good picture is kind of a nice thing. Um, oh, I love this. Highlighting them in social media posts. That's important. And again, if your volunteers are on social media and know which social media they're on, we know that generationally, some of us aren't in some, um, some outlets of social media, so paying attention to which ones matter to them. Um, ooh, and hats, that's a cool one. I love hats, especially, and I think about some of your outdoor opportunities. It would be nice thinking about water bottles and hats and those things they might wear that's protective gear. Um, that's also a place for you to put your logo. I was told once, because I work with 4-H and I, and I had a district director who said, if it stands still, you're gonna put a clover on it. And it's like, yep, I absolutely am. It's a symbol of belonging for the volunteers and it's a way for the public to say, oh, that's cool. I didn't know 4-H was here. Starts a conversation. Um, yeah, and there you go, Natalie, face masks. Boy, that's the thing right now, isn't it? We got to wear them anyway. So you might as well put your logo on there and, and, and own it. So yeah, docent face masks. Um, awesome. So great, some great ideas. Hopefully something that will spark some, um, some new ideas for you all to try. Um, I want to pay attention to my time here. We're all right. So um, one of the other things we want to do is gather data for impact and accountability. We want to be making sure that we know not only how many hours they're working, but um, the difference they're making in a client's life. So how are you know what is what is what is happening? Not just that they give gave us this many hours, but they distributed this much food, or they cleared this many trails, or they did the work of this many full-time staff members. So what are the things that we can point to to say it was impact and that we can be accountable to our partners and our stakeholders and our donors and our um, and other folks who are paying attention to what we're doing and how we're doing it. So making sure that we are um, telling the story with data as best we can is going to be an important part of our um, of our volunteer program. So gather that information. Don't overlook the, the importance of getting more than just years of service, more than just hours of service, but really think about how can you measure the impact of what they're doing, not, not just outputs, but outcomes. 
And so some of that is going to start early in the year when you're designing your programs and making sure that you're paying attention to how am I going to best tell this story, which leads me to tell your story. Don't be so quiet, quietly efficient that, that you're overlooked. Um, I worked with a group at um, a hospital auxiliary at one point, and they were so great at what they did. They had like 800 volunteers in a multi-building campus, and they were doing really cool stuff. And then the hospital had to make adjustments in the budget. And as they looked at it, they said, the volunteers do this stuff. And they took away the volunteer coordinator's role. Well, you know, let's own it. If you work with volunteer management, you know that a lot of it might happen, but a lot of it won't. If you're not sitting there making the magic move, it's not going to happen. And so she was so quietly efficient about getting it done that they didn't quite realize her role in some of that. So if you are managing volunteers, make sure that when you tell that story, there's some place in there that you talk about the importance of having a professional who understands how to engage volunteers in the program. Don't be so quietly efficient that you work yourself out of a job. So pay attention to that. Um, then um, relationships are keys. This is one of the things that we've especially found um, in COVID times, that idea that if we are taking care of our volunteers, they are going to stick with us. Um, and that means that we try to build connections even virtually. So not only are we um, working when we're face to face to remember their name and to make sure they have what they need and to say thank you and happy birthday and how's your family and we're asking about them, but we're also doing those things online. We're doing that with an email. Um, we're doing that with opportunities for them um, to engage in social hours. A lot of, I mean, we had one group that was decorating cookies online together. We send them kits to decorate cookies. And, and so we got together and had somebody instructing and you're, you're trying it out at home by your, you know, with, with your kit of materials. And so um, having opportunities for your volunteers to engage with one another, to network. Some of your volunteers are seeking volunteer opportunities because they're looking for that social opportunity. And so COVID has really um, become a challenge for us to think about how are we gonna engage people um, and how are we gonna keep connected to them? Because those people who are connected are gonna be the ones who come back. They're gonna be the ones that stay with us through the shutdowns and the reopenings and, and all that kind of stuff that we're dealing with. And so pay attention to the relationships um, with your volunteers. We know that the number one reason that people volunteer is because someone asked, and the number one reason why they don't volunteer is because nobody asked. And so um, make sure that you're asking them to volunteer and recruiting them, but then make sure that you're paying attention to the relationship so that they stay with us um, and don't move away from us. So if you've been keeping count, you realize that that was only nine things to consider, right? And some of you are list makers and you've been writing them down and you know that I've only done none. And so here's your opportunity to tell me, what do you think I missed? What's one thing when you think about the things that we've talked about risk management and role descriptions, and we've talked about orientation and we've talked about managing relationships and we've talked about recognition. What can you think of that we've not talked about that somebody who's new to volunteer engagement Drop us something in the chat over there. If there's something that you're thinking, you know she's going to talk about this. Something that, and there's, there's not really a wrong answer here because I looked at lots of people's research. So I'm just curious to know what you all think that tent bottom might be. So share something at recruitment. We did, yeah, retention. We didn't, we didn't spend a lot of time on either of those, did we? Recruitment, retention, other things about basics that you think might have been um, something to think about. And you all talked about generations and that's a great place when you think about recruitment and retention. Going back to the information around generations is always a great thing to, to think about. Um, I did not talk about continuing education. I did not talk about diversity. Individualism, I love that. Um, demographics, which gets us a little bit into the whole understanding of um, diversity, equity, inclusion, those kinds of things. So yeah, thinking about audience, thinking about who we're talking to and who we're serving, who are our clients. Um, there you go. 
us, the volunteer programs and the volunteer program managers who are in a profession that is rapidly changing and relatively new when we think about um, jobs and careers, it's a relatively new career. Um, amenities and, and perks to offer. So yeah, some ideas for how we get and keep our volunteers by including some of those recognition kinds of opportunities. Um, I will tell you that among the next um, items on my list, one was involving volunteers in the processes. And so I think some of you have kind of covered some of that. Um, evaluation, we talked a little bit about impact and accountability, but we didn't really talk about individual evaluations and your volunteers need to be evaluated much like your paid staff are. They, um, they deserve to get some feedback about what's working, but also to give you feedback about what's working in your program. Um, so one of the things that I would mention to you is the idea that um, your board members, advisory boards, um, boards of directors, don't forget them as potential volunteers. Oftentimes we think they're giving us so much, but it's really helpful if we can get them to be engaged as a volunteer in some of our activities because they see it from a different perspective, makes them a better board member. So consider um, inviting them to be a volunteer. So you guys have great ideas here. Um, I do um, think, Jessica, that it's really important for folks to think about um, investing in yourselves. Um, paying attention to your professional development and the opportunities that are that are there for you to um, to be even better at your job. I'm going to mention very quickly connecting with your peers through the North Carolina Association of Volunteer Administration. They have a conference coming up in September. It's a virtual conference, um, and so I encourage you to 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 check that out. Um, the Association of Leaders in Volunteer Engagement, ALAV, is kind of the national association that is trying to help be a part of a consortium, um, a team of folks who are looking at volunteerism at the national level and trying to help folks come together and um, build some strategies around how we move forward as a profession, um, advocating for the profession. And so I encourage you to check out those organizations, um, include my contact information here and the conference organizers have it as well. I, I welcome emails and contacts. Um, to further discuss either our certificate program or just to ask a question. I'm happy to, um, to talk volunteer engagement with folks. So with that, I'm going to stop and take a breath because we have, um, I have been doing a lot of talking. Um, so, and I'm going to ask, let's see, who is my host? Is it Cindy? Yes. Okay. So, yes, if anybody's got any questions, Dr. Edwards, I think we've been doing a lot of that during the presentation. Thank you so much for this great presentation today. I've, I've been writing all kinds of notes up here myself while, awesome. while you were doing it. So if you weren't looking at me seeing you, I was checking my other screen. So now is the time we can check. Maybe if we don't have any questions, a couple more minutes to stretch our legs one last time and uh, come back in 15 minutes. Oh, they want the email address again, they were hearing. There we go. Um, and then at four o'clock, we're gonna have some closing remarks and some more questions and answers. And hopefully you'll stay on Dr. Edwards and answer any questions that may come up during this four o'clock period. So yeah, looks like, so thank you so much. Looks like there's no questions. Everybody's saying thank you. 